Would you please kneel with me and let's pray with and for one another. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we want our names to be found written in the pages wide and fair, in the book of thy kingdom, the Lamb's book of life. And we're praying, dear God, that even though many are going to lay down their cross, there are many that are going to choose Barabbas instead of Jesus. There are those that are going to repudiate the troops of the first, second, and third angels' messages. We're praying that we would be grounded and settled and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. We ask for the blessings of the Holy Spirit to be with us this morning as we've come to seek your face in righteousness and in meekness, as we come looking for a fresh and living experience that will help us not only in our daily work of perfecting Christian character, but even in times to come. The storms of persecution, the fiery trial which is to try us. We're praying that that which we hear today and as we've been hearing from all the ministers uh, would help us to uh, press forward in the straight and narrow way, to press the battle to the gate, and that we could be victor victorious and overcomers as Jesus was an overcomer. But thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. Uh, bless us now as we open the scriptures together and pour out your spirit that we might have an understanding of your word, that we could be doers of that word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. This morning the Bible tells us in the book of Philippians chapter 3, the book of Philippians chapter 3, as we continue with our study regarding the enemies of the cross of Christ, which we began on Monday evening. We're continuing in that study this morning of Philippians chapter 3 and beginning here in verse 17. Again, Philippians, the third chapter, verses 17, starting there, reading to verse 19. The Apostle Paul writes to the saints of the church at Philippi, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an ensample. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. And so today we're continuing looking at verse 19 where we started on Wednesday, uh, rather Monday night, and we talked about those whose end is destruction. And we were linking this message of the enemies of the cross of Christ to those that ultimately will reject the third angel's message and will receive the mark of the beast and will receive the plagues and the condemnation that comes upon Babylon and those that commit fornication with her. We also touched on whose God is their belly. And of course, we made applications to uh, health reform and diet reform and even dress reform and showing that these reforms that God has given in the place and context of the third angel um, are representing the cross that God wants us to lift up at the end of the world. And we looked at some statements upon the end of our meeting. And so we're going to continue looking at whose God is their belly and get it also into whose glory is in their shame and who mind earthly things. These are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And so at the end of the world, you and I are either the enemies of the cross of Christ or we are the friends or the messengers, the servants, uh, the ambassadors of the cross of Christ in context of the third angel. I want you to go back with me to the book of Romans 16 as we were looking at something in the book of Romans chapter 16, although we read it, we did not really cover it. And so we want to do that just now. And there's a warning against false teachers in Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. 
and concerning those who serve their belly. Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. The Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So this is very uh, strong uh, language here. Those that are causing divisions and offenses among you, contrary to the doctrine that you received, it says you need to mark them and also avoid them. Because they're not serving Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, their own personal interests, uh, seeking to gain personal advantage, uh, whether it's for filthy lucre, or whether it's for the control of the conscience, uh, whether it is to gain disciples after themselves and speaking perverse things contrary to the, to the gospel of Christ that was delivered unto you, the Bible tells us, it says, mark them and avoid them. Now, we ask the question, we're going to answer it now, how are offenses and divisions caused among the people of God? This is what we want to look at just now. And so we're going to actually turn right over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, just right after Romans 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Again, how are dissension, uh, discord, um, offenses, how do these things come in among us as a people? And we're going to find that this was a theme that Paul, as a minister of the gospel, had to constantly deal with as he had several churches under his care and charge. And so we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning here in verse 10. The apostle says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So in other words, to speak the same thing, we must have the same mind and the same judgment, and that is not my mind, that is not my judgment, but it is the mind of Christ, and it is the judgment of the Lord. Because if we all have the mind of Christ, and if we're all one with Christ, even as the Father and the Son are one in John 17, then that unity individually with Christ will also bring us on one accord with each other, as you also are one with Christ and are receiving His mind and His Spirit and have His same judgment. Otherwise, we cannot speak the same things, and there will be divisions and offenses that will be amongst us. But it was Paul's prayer that there be no divisions, be no schisms, no fractions, as it was in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not to be broken up, as it were. Even as we consider the human body, um, if our patella is fractured or um, our, our, our fingers or our hands or different joints of the body, well then obviously all the members of that body are going to suffer with that member. They're all going to be affected some way or another. And so we continue on in verse number 11. And it says here, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God and that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus, Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And so we find that the divisions, the schisms that come in amongst us are the same issues and problems that were way back in the church of Ephesus, in the beginning of the gospel dispensation, where you had Christians both Jew and Gentile, clinging tenaciously to their favorite ministers or their favorite ministries that they love to support and follow. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter, or I am of Cephas. In other words, 
divisions and offenses and, and schisms coming amongst us when we begin to start promoting men in their ministries. Instead of promoting the word of God, Amen. the testimony of Jesus Christ, the, the Holy Ghost, the third angel's message, we're pushing men to the front and lifting up and exalting their ministries. And I can almost imagine how it must have been in this particular time because you can imagine some saying, well, listen, I, I follow Paul because Paul speaks more tongues than all of them. And Paul's had visions and revelations that no man could, could, could see or, or hear, or it's not even lawful to speak. He was called up to the third heaven. I'm going to follow Paul. And some might say, well, listen, I'm going to follow Peter because, see, Peter was one of the original pioneers. He was one of the original 12. And so he's the one that actually saw Jesus. He worked with Jesus. He lived with Jesus. Hey, he even denied Jesus and was restored back to ministry. So Peter's the head of the church. He's the leader of the church, so I'm going to follow Peter's ministry. And some might say, well, listen, Apollos, though, was mighty in the scriptures. He was a very powerful and very eloquent man of God. And so even in the time of Corinthians, they were divided. Offenses were coming in because people were choosing their favorite ministries and denouncing those people that did not follow their favorite minister. Now, I wonder if that's happening amongst us today as well. You realize that certain people are not even here today because of their favorite minister, their favorite ministry. And because they have their favorite minister or favorite ministry, well, I'm going to pass out their DVDs. I'm going to give out their messages on Facebook and YouTube and social media, e email inbox, and, and so on and so forth. And if you're not following them, then you're not on the platform today. You don't have the third angel. You're not giving the midnight cry. You're not giving the trumpet a certain sound unless you're following Paul or Peter or Barnabas. And when we have this mindset, it lets us know that we don't have the mind of Christ, but yet another mind. And notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, what that mind is. Now, it's interesting if we really took the Bible as it said, it says that we're to mark them and avoid them. Those that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine. They're not serving Jesus Christ, but their own bellies. They're enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, who shame or whose glory is in their shame and they mind earthly things. First Corinthians three, verse one, it says, and I brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet spiritual. For where, you're what now? You're carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and, I, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then there is neither, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. So the Bible lets us know when we have this I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Peter. That's a carnal mind. You need to be born again. You're not converted. You want the meat of God's word, but you really need the milk. The sincere milk of the word, the ABCs of practical Christianity, Christian standards and, and behavior, kindness, charity, brotherly love. This is what one needs. This is the remedy or the antidote to the party spirit. I'm not here to push my ministry. I'm here to push the word of God. I'm here to push and exalt the cross of Christ. And to make Jesus the great center of attraction of the third angel. I don't need any followers. I don't need any supporters. I don't need anybody looking to me as though I'm some prophet or that I'm someone that needs to be worshiped as having the 
advancing light of the third angel, having the latter rain message, and therefore you must come to me in order to be sealed by God. And if you reject anything I say, you're lost. That's a carnal mindset. You're an enemy of the cross of Christ and need to be born again. These are those that serve their own bellies because it's all about the most reviews. It's about the most views. It's about the most donations. It's about who gets the tithe, who gets, who gets the offering. It becomes like spiritual politics, spiritual politicians, as it were. Now, this is worldliness. This is ungodliness. This results of much evil. The Bible tells us that we should have nothing to do with it. We're not to fight and attack other ministries, even if they don't agree with us or they don't see eye to eye with us. It is not our, our mission to do battle with them. We need to do battle against self. We need to do battle against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, but never turning the weapons of our warfare on other brethren or other ministries. Now, the Bible lets us know that they, their God is their belly, and the Bible says that their glory is in their shame. What is shame? Shame is dishonor. Shame is to be disgraceful. So they're glorying or they're proud, they're excited in their dishonor and in that which is shameful, the Bible tells us. Word of God also explains to us in the book of Psalms. Go with me to the book of Psalms, Psalms 4. As we now look at whose glory is in their shame. Psalms 4, looking together here in verse 2. Psalms 4 and verse 2. The Bible says here, O ye sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into what, everybody? Shame. How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. So there's a contrast here between the godly and the ungodly. And the Bible talks about the sons of men that are turning his glory or God's character, God's righteousness into shame. How long are you going to love vanity and seek after leasing? What does that mean? You're seeking after leasing, you're loving vanity. The glory of God is turned into shame. These are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now let's look at this vanity for a moment. Go to the book of 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings, what chapter did we say? 17. Chapter 17 and beginning in verse 15. The glory of God is turned into shame or disgrace or dishonor. Because we love vanity, we seek after leasing. The Bible says in the book of 2 Kings 17 in verse 15. As a matter of fact, I want to begin here in verse 13. 2 uh, Kings chapter 17 verse 13 says, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. And notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he testified against them. And they followed what everybody? Vanity, Vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And so how does one become vain or how does one follow vanity or love vanity? There's a process that takes place. The Bible's describing apostasy. It's describing rebellion, a stubbornness, and, 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 and stiff neck hearts, stretch forth necks. It's interesting that they rejected his statues and his covenant and his testimonies, and as a result, they followed vanity and became vain. They went after the heathen or the world 
round about them. And verse 16, it says, And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God, and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served Baal. So vanity, to love vanity, is associated with Baal worship, with sun worship, with spiritualism, with human sacrifices. You leave all the commandments of God, you reject all the testimonies, all his statues and his covenant, and you become like the heathen and you follow after vanity and become vain, as it were. But the Bible says also, how long will you speak leasing? You love vanity, you seek leasing, you're turning my glory into shame. Bible tells us here in the book of Psalms again, go back to Psalms, this time chapter 5, Psalms, the fifth chapter. What is leasing? Lying. That's right. Lying. Deception. So when you love vanity, which is connected with idolatry, apostasy, rebellion from, from the law and from the prophets, from his covenant, then you also speak lies. Deception. In Psalms 5, beginning in verse 4, Psalms 5 and verse 4 says, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak what? Leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and what kind of man? Deceitful man. So notice some of the adjectives that are connected with those that are speaking leasing. Bible says that they're bloody and they're deceitful. The Word of God also says that they're workers of iniquity. The foolish cannot stand in his sight. Who are the foolish workers of iniquity? Who are the foolish workers of iniquity? I want you to hold your place here, or you don't have to hold your place there. Turn with me quickly to Matthew chapter 7. The Gospel according to Matthew chapter 7 going to begin in verse 21 now. Who are the foolish workers of iniquity that are bloody and deceitful and that speak leasing? They love vanity. They turn God's glory into shame. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Jesus speaking, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work righteousness. Iniquity. iniquity. So what do we find? The workers of iniquity, the foolish, they are the ones that are saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And we're going to see that in just a moment. Matter of fact, just go to Matthew 25 so that we can connect the foolish here, because it doesn't say in Matthew 7, but if we go to Matthew 25 and the very end of the ten virgin parable, we find in verse 10. But in Matthew 7 it describes those that are in ministry, those that are preaching, those that are healing, those that are casting out devils, those that are winning souls. These are the ones that say, Lord, Lord. And they're not all false prophets. Many of them are preaching a, a true message. They're casting out devils. They're doing many wonderful works in his name. The prophesying, the casting out of devils, and the wonderful works are not condemned of Christ in Matthew 7. What's condemned is that they did not do God's will. Even though they were involved in ministry and in service, they were workers of iniquity. And therefore he says, I do not know who you are. And that is the great deception of the foolish. Thinking that they know Christ, they're doing these things in his name, but they really don't know him because if they really knew him, they would depart from iniquity. <clears throat> so I thus can fulfill Matthew chapter 7, preaching, casting out devils, doing many wonderful works. But if I don't depart from iniquity, and Christ says, I don't know who you are. You're a false disciple. You're antichrist. Matthew 25, 10 says, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with them to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. 
But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Is this not the same class that Jesus was talking about in Matthew 7? Yeah, so, it's, so, so, in, so in Psalms 5, the foolish workers of iniquity that speak leasing are foolish virgins, but they are those that are doing apostolic work. They are those that are involved in ministry. Sister White says they're evangelists, they're call porters, they're Bible workers, they're Bible instructors. And Matthew chapter 7 is talking about, this is not just talking about false prophets that lead people to break the commandments of God, but even those that are in the service of God can lead people to break God's law as they look to those that are holding up truth, but it's in unrighteousness. Bible tells us now as we go to Ezekiel 13, as we speak about leasing, we speak about lies, we speak about deception. What does God think about this? They're turning my glory into shame. It's possible that a minister or profess believer in present truth could actually turn God's glory into shame. Could actually make that which is holy, that which should be sacred, to a disgrace, a dishonor, a stench in the nostrils of the people round about. Ezekiel chapter 13 tells us this. Ezekiel 13, speaking about the false prophets in Israel. It says here in verse 6, they have seen vanity and lying divination. Divination is witchcraft or spiritualism. Saying, the Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them, and they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have you not seen a vain vision? And have you not spoken a lying divination? Whereas you say, the Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies or leasing, therefore behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God, and my hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. Now notice, it says, they shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel, neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So their names are not going to be written among the righteous. They're not going to be found among the congregation of the saints. They're not entering into the land of Israel, not Palestine on earth in the Middle East, but rather the land of Israel in heaven, the Bible is speaking about. Verse 10 goes on to saying, because even because they have seduced my people, saying peace, and there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. I'm going to drop down to verse 19. Verse 19, it says, And will you pollute me among my people for what? Handfuls of barley, Handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread. Stop there. Now God is talking to the false prophets now, those that are speaking leasing, those that are deceitful, those that are deceiving the people, seducing them. God says, you're going to pollute me among my own people for what? For bread. What, is, what does that mean? What, what comes to view? When you think of basically they're doing this bloody and deceitful work for money, for bread. In other words, they don't serve the Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly enemies of the cross of Christ. You're polluting me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread. And then notice what it goes on to say. It says to slay the souls that should not die and to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies. This is pretty serious here. So in other words, these false prophets are destroying those that really should be saved alive, shouldn't be killed, and then those really that should die, you're trying to preserve and save them alive. I'm not taking any comments or questions right now. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but we want to just continue on here this morning. We appreciate it. Hope no one's offended. Let's now go to the book of Hosea, chapter 4. Book of Hosea now, chapter 4. As we're talking about speaking leasing, we're talking about turning God's glory into shame. This is what is taking place among the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame. Hosea chapter 4, beginning in verse 6 now. What is God going to do? 
to those that love vanity, those that speak leasing, to those that are turning his glory into shame, what's going to happen to them? Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 tells us, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into what? So notice now, as they've turned God's glory into shame, now God says, now you've rejected my knowledge, you've rejected my law, you've forgotten it actually. What is the one commandment that God told us to remember? Sabbath. The Sabbath commandment. So in, in a prophetic sense, we know that people are forgetting the law now, but when is God's law going to be forgotten on a national, worldwide scale? Local, universal, Sunday law. So we can see Hosea 4, 6 pointing to the Sunday law crisis. And then now God says, well, now that which is your glory, I'm going to change it into shame now. So it's interesting. Well, what is their glory? We're going to find what their glory is, that they are excited about, that they're uplifting, that they're actually proud about. Your glory is going to be turned into shame. Verse 8, it says, they eat up the sin of my people and they set their heart on their iniquity. And there shall be like people, like priests, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them their doings. For they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase, because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. My people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declare it unto them. For the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err. They have gone a whoring from under their God. They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills under oaks and poplars and elms because the shadow thereof is good. Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom and your spouses shall commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom nor your spouses when they commit adultery for they themselves are separated with whores and they sacrifice with harlots. Therefore the people that doth not understand shall fall. Though thou Israel play the harlot, yet let not Judah offend, and come not ye unto Gilgal, neither go you up to Beth Avon, nor swear the Lord liveth. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Ephraim is joined to his idols, let him alone. Their glory that's going to be turned into shame is their idolatry. It's their whoredom. It's their fornication. This is what they are glorying in. And God says, I'm going to make that disgraceful. I'm going to make it dishonorable, the very dishonorable thing that it is. They glory in their golden calf. They glory in the images of four-footed beasts and creeping things. They glory in the sun. I'm going to turn that into shame, the Bible says. So their God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame. Turn to Jeremiah 3. Jeremiah 3, verse 3. As we come to the last description of the enemies of the cross of Christ, Jeremiah 3 and verse 3 tells us this. Because remember, Hosea said that they're separated with whores, they commit whoredom, they commit adultery, and they do this by their graven images, by their molten images and other gods. Jeremiah 3.3 3 says, Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hast a whore's forehead, thou refusest to be what? So this is their glory and their shame. The fact that they have a whore's forehead, a carnal mind, not the mind of Christ. What does the whore's forehead look like? You know what's written on it. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. But what is it about the whore's forehead or the mind of the harlot? What is the mind of a harlot? When you consider the church of Thyatira, that woman Jezebel, which corresponds to the scarlet great whore in Revelation 17, you realize that in Revelation 2, God says that she was calling herself a prophetess, teaching and seducing his servants to 
commit fornication and eat things sacrificed on idols. Then he says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication. But what did she do? Or what, what did she not do? She didn't repent. So in other words, the mind of the harlot is the mind that refuses to turn around. It's the mind that refuses to repent. Although probationary time is given to you, God's grace is revealed to you, the gospel, the law of God, the spirit of God, the, 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 the cross of Christ, all presented to us. But in all that space of time, there was no repentance. We saw that in the history of the Protestant reformers under Martin Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Melanchthon, Huss, Jerome, all the reformers. And all during that time, God was trying to do a work to bring her to repentance, to bring her back to sola scriptura, to bring her back to the just shall live by faith, to bring her back to the prophecies of Daniel Revelation, to the word of God, to exalt a pure standard. And yet during all this time, she refused to repent. Repentance is involving a change of mind, a sorrow of heart for sin and a turning away from it. This is the mind of a harlot. This is why the latter rain does not come unto us because the whore's forehead is an incorrigible mind, a mind that will not change, will not repent, will not turn it around. The Bible tells us whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. Their glory is in their shame and they mind earthly things. And of course, when we think of their shame, we know that this has to point to us because Revelation 3, verse 17 and 18, speaking about Laodicea, tells us very plainly that we ought to buy of him gold tried in the fire that we may be rich and anoint our eyes with eyes out that we may see and also, or rather, be clothed with his white raiment that the shame of our own nakedness is not revealed. When God's people are naked, it's because of apostasy. You think back to Adam and Eve in the garden. They were clothed with those garments of light, just as God covers himself with a garment of light, and that garment departed from them, why? Because they sinned at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They accepted another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit, brought to them by the beast power or the serpent. And as a result, the woman was overcome. And she ended up being naked. She gave the fruit to her husband. He ate it. He also was naked. What about the time of the golden calf apostasy at the foot of Mount Sinai? When Exodus 32 describes the dancing of the children of Israel, and it says that Aaron had made them naked unto the shame of their own enemies, apostasy. We find various different places in the Bible where, where men were, were, were naked or men were stripped of their garments because of sin, disobedience. So the shame of their own nakedness appearing, this is Laodicea glorying in the fact that they're poor, they're blind, they're wretched, they're miserable and they're naked and glorying in this and are going to be spewed out of his mouth. Who mind earthly things. What are these earthly things? that they are minding or their mind is upon. Turn to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, starting with verse 13. Coming to the fourth description here concerning the enemies of the cross of Christ. James, the third chapter in verse 13 The Bible says here in verse 13, it says, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and some evil work, Every. most evil work, Every. Every evil work, so wherever there is strife and confusion, there is every evil work, confusion. This is earthly, sensual, and devilish. 
And not one of us are above falling into this temptation, including myself. Strife and envy. The minute you step out of Christ, or the minute the Spirit of God is not possessing you, I myself, any one of us are capable of manifesting the Spirit. So we talk about Babylon. Babylon means confusion. Rightly so, but we can almost replicate the spirit of Babylon among us with every, with, with confusion and with every evil work and envying and strife, the Bible says. And the word of the Lord says, don't lie against the truth. Don't glory not. If I have bitter envy and strife in my heart, glory not and lie not against the truth. So this is really a hard problem. What does it mean to lie against the truth? There's a statement here in the study Bible I'd like to read. It's, it's under the very comments of James 3, 13, and 14 of the Ellen White Study Bible. You may have it. It's also in Review and Herald, March 12, 1895, where it says, What is lying against the truth? It is claiming to believe the truth while the spirit, the words, the deportment represent not Christ but Satan. To surmise evil, to be impatient and unforgiving is lying against the truth. Let me repeat that again. To be impatient, and unforgiving is lying against the truth. But love, patience, and long forbearance are in accordance with the principles of truth. Truth is ever pure, ever kind, breathing a heavenly fragrance unmingled with selfishness. How often have we been guilty, as I know I have, against lying against the truth? So again, there's a, there's a way of holding the truth, but it's in righteousness. This is our, our test. Not whether or not we accept the truth or know the truth, because we, we accept and know it, but how are we holding it up? Are we giving the truth a, 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 a right representation? As many times we look and we say, well, look, people are rejecting the truth. No, people are not rejecting the truth. People are rejecting you and how it's coming across, lying against the truth. Because in verse 17 of James 3, it says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercies and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. And brethren, as I said Monday night, I'm not preaching something to you that I myself don't need. I need this message, more, probably more so than anybody here. And this is no lie. This is a fact. This is the truth. I'm not coming together and coming before you preaching something that I myself don't need or that I myself am not grappling with. But I figure that if it's, if it's good for me, it should be good for someone else. We consider in Colossians 3, Colossians the third chapter, and we speak about these earthly things that our minds are upon. What, is, what are those earthly things? Well, we saw some of them, envying, lying, being unforgiving, holding grudges, holding on to resentment. We're lying against the truth when we do that. This wisdom is earthly, sensual, devilish. You're in Colossians 3, beginning in verse 1. Colossians chapter 3. So we're identifying a lot of characteristics and things that make one an enemy of the cross of Christ. And we must do this because the Word of God says so, but our desire is not to just end there, brethren. We have to have a solution to these things. We have to see a remedy for these things. We have to see how we can be free from these things and not fall into this condemnation. Oh no, God does not cut us and wound us and leave us there to die, but He will heal us and He will bind us up if we're willing to receive his healing touch and power. Colossians 3.1, it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon or in heaven, upon the earth. So here are these earthly things now. Bible says fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, 
For which things sake the wrath of, the, of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Remember the children of disobedience. In the which ye also walked some time when you lived in them. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is where? Or Christ is all and where? In all. And in all. So there's a list of these earthly things that our minds and affections are set on. And if our minds are set on these things, we're dead to Christ, but alive unto the world and of sin, then obviously that's going to make us the enemies of the cross of Christ. We'll fight and oppose against the cross of Christ. As we're coming to an end now, I want you to go back to the book of James as we share a last point this morning. We'll go to James chapter 4. Fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, evil concupiscence. It matters not what sin it is. The Bible tells us it's all idolatry. And it's all coming upon, the wrath of God will come upon the children of disobedience. And sometimes we like to think that the children of disobedience are the children of the world, but no, the children of disobedience are simply God's children that profess to be of his household, but just don't obey him. Those are the children of disobedience. We're in James 4 again, We're coming to an end now. We talk about the enemies of the cross of Christ. Notice in James chapter 4, another descriptive agitation or adjective, I should say, of the, of the same people. James 4, 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So enemies of the cross of Christ, enemy of God is somebody that is a friend of the world. Or in other words, you're the world's friend. Now, question Understanding that God calls us adulterers and adulteresses, so, so obviously this friendship with the world, this alliance with the world, it's spiritual adultery. We're breaking our vows before God. As he is our husband and we're supposed to be presented as a chaste virgin unto Christ. Wonder why it is that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, because this is strong language. This, this doesn't just simply mean that God dislikes it or God disapproves of it. But he says enmity. What is enmity? This is, this is perfect hatred. This is serious hatred here. Where it goes just beyond that, well, I, I just don't like you. That's not what we're talking about. Friendship with the world is enmity or hatred with God. And he says, if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. Why is it such hatred? and hostility, where there is no peace, there is no compromise, there is no treaty or concession between being a friend of God and a friend of the world. Well, James, or rather 1 John 2, 15 to 17 tells us that we're not to love the world. And these are the things that are in the world. Because if any man has the love of the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And that is of the world and not of the Father. And the world's going to pass away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of my God will abide forever. So we know that, and this is a balance here because we're not to, we're not to love the world in the context of loving the things in the world. And what are those things? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and pride of life we're not to love. However, we're told when we, matter of fact, how do we know when Christ's mission for us is fulfilled? I'm not talking about Christ's mission for the world per se, but I'm talking about for you. When, yes, when we love the world as he loved the world, then his mission for us is accomplished. 
His work for us is done, and we're ready for heaven, she says. Well, how did he love the world? He, got, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So in other words, we're to have self-sacrificing love for those that are in the world. But we're not to love the things in the world like the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and prior life. So we have to clarify that, qualify that. Now, with that being said, go to John 15 for a moment. And we're doing pretty good with time. So let's, let's go to John 15. Why is friendship with the world? In other words, the world is at peace with you. The world is comfortable with you. The world accepts you. You're no threat to the world. And yet you're a follower of Christ. Is that possible? To be a follower of Christ and yet have a worldly alliance, to have a warm, fuzzy, cozy alliance or relationship with the world. Is that possible as a true Christian? In John 15, listen to what Jesus says in verse 16. John 15, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 16, it says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, if the world what? Hate you. Hates you. You know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. In other words, you'd be a friend of the world. It says very clearly, the world would love his own, but because you are not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. So not only has God, he's chosen us out of the world and therefore the world would hate us because it hated Christ. Why did it hate Christ? Well, look at this. But he said, I've ordained you that you should go forth and bear fruit. Whatever you ask in my name, it'll be done unto you. So God has chosen us out of the world for service, for ministry. He's called us to bear fruit. Fruit of the Spirit in our lives and fruit in soul winning. Look at verse 20. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had come, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. So notice. Why is friendship with the world enmity with God? It's hatred with God. God hates this. Spiritual adultery, this worldly lines. Why? Well, the Bible lets us know that the world hated Christ. And Christ has called us out of the world to be separate from the world, to be in the world but not of the world. And yet he says, if they've persecuted me, you know they're going to persecute you. If they would have kept my sayings, they would keep yours also. Why does the world hate Christ? Because of the works that he did because of his lifestyle, his message, his teaching. In fact, go to John 7 with me. John, the seventh chapter, beginning in verse 1. Why does the world hate Christ? Think about this. You would be a friend of the world, and yet it's very clear that the world is not Christ's friend. So how are you Christ's friend and the world's friend? Is that possible? Can a man serve two masters? Jesus said, no, now you would attempt to, you would try to do so, but you can't. And he that is not with me is against me. He that is not gathering with us scattereth abroad. John 7, verse 1, it says, After these things Jesus walked into Galilee, for he would not walk in jewelry, because the Jews sought to kill him. 
Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he, he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou doest these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are good. So Jesus said, look, the world can't hate you, his unbelieving brethren that did not really believe in him, that were mocking him and deriding him and belittling his mission. He says, the world can't hate you, but me it hates because I do what? I testify that the works thereof are what? They're evil. Now, did God send his son into the world to condemn the world? But that the world might be what? So then what is the condemnation then on the world? Because the world is condemned. Although that was not God's desire to condemn the world. He wanted to save the world. This is why he gave his only begotten. Go to John 3 with me. The book of John 3 what is the world's condemnation? Or in other words, they hate him because he testifies that it is evil. Now, you can't say that Christ was out of character. You can't say that Christ was harsh or he was mean or he was unforgiving, he was unloving. Now, you might be able to charge that to me in my earthliness, but you can't charge that to Christ, my Lord. Every rebuke he uttered, those, those scathing rebukes and those terrible denunciations of hypocrisy and iniquity, we're told, were always done with tears in his eyes. Right? He never necessarily wanted to offend anyone purposely. He had a very tender heart. He's very compassionate, very gentle, bold as a lion, Amen. and yet at the same time meek as a lamb. Just a perfect blend. So if Jesus is testifying that the world is evil, you know he's doing it in the right spirit. He's doing it with the right character, with the right tone, not impatient, not passionate. John 3, verse 19 says, and this is the condemnation. Rather, let me back up to verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were good, evil. And everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So what is the problem here? What is the world's condemnation? That light has come into the world, and we love darkness rather than light. And we're not going to come to the light because we don't want to be reproved. You see, we don't really want the truth. We want darkness. Woe, woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. Those that put light for darkness and darkness for light, sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet. This is why the world is condemned. And the Bible says that they hated Christ for this. They persecuted him for this, and they're going to hate you and persecute you if you're manifesting my spirit and have my character and doing my work. The same hatred and persecution that I receive is going to come upon you. So then how can you, being my friend, being my, because he calls us friends, being, our, being associates, being co-laborers together, how can you then be their friend, the friend of the world, when you know what the world thinks about me? what the world does to me. What did the world do to him? The world killed him. As a matter of fact, let's go to 1 John 3 and look at this. 1 John chapter 3. Drawing to a, to a close here. John, uh, 1 John 3. I want to read verse 1 now. 1 John 3 and verse 1. I can't believe that in all this time it's only been 58 minutes. I wish every time I spoke it was like this. Usually it's an hour and a half already. It's going on two hours. 1 John 3 verse 1, listen to what it says. 
1 John 3, 1, Behold the, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because what? So as a son of God, or as a daughter of God, just like the world didn't know him, the world's not going to know us. In other, words, in, other, in other words, the world was not his friend. And the world will not be our friend either. Not because of fanaticism, not because of bigotry, not because of Phariseeism, but because of manifesting the Spirit of Christ in thought, word, and action, and doctrine. Verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Drop to verse 11. So a son of God is like him, and the world did not know him. As a matter of fact, it's interesting that Isaiah 53, verse 2 says, He hath no form and no comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Not that Jesus was unattractive in his physical likeness and image, but that the world saw no beauty in holiness. Because the Bible talks about worshiping God in the beauty of holiness. There's beauty in holiness. And so because of his holiness, they were not attracted to his holiness. There was nothing in Christ that outwardly attracted or drew men to himself. Therefore, they saw no beauty that they should desire him. Only purity, only holiness, only honor, virtue and truth and righteousness was the beauty that Christ possessed. It drew the faithful to him. But look at 1 John 3, 11. It says, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Why did Cain slay his brother? Because Cain's works were evil, and his brother's was righteous. Why did they kill Jesus? Because Abel was the first Christian martyr that pointed to Christ. And just as Abel was slain by his brother, was not Jesus also slain by the brotherhood of humanity? He was a brother with them. They killed him. The church and the world together. As a matter of fact, the Bible goes on to say in verse 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. So this is why we can't be friends with the world. Because the world hated Christ persecuted Christ because he testified of the evil. He was not a fanatic. He was not an offshoot. He was not an extremist. He was not a gazing stock. He gave the, mess the right message with the right spirit and with the right character. And yet we're told that when we reach the standard that God would have us reach, the world would regard us as odd, singular, straight-laced extremists. Did you know that? When you're reaching the standard that God would have you to reach, that's how the world would regard you. I want to ask you a question. Who were those that were responsible for the death of Christ? Everybody. And on the cross of Christ, there was a title that was made or written in three languages. How many languages? Three. What were those languages? Greek, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. This represented the whole world. This was the threefold enemy that came together to crucify him. Hebrew, Greek, and Latin represented the symbols of the dragon, beast, and false prophet in Christ's day. Those three frogs, those spirits of devils. And you notice something interesting as you go to Acts 4, then I want to end in the book of Luke and read something to you. Go to Acts 4. Because the question I want to ask as we end here is, how does one make a friendship with the world? In other words, how does the world come together as friends? That's what we want to look at in closing. This friendship with the world. And understand why God says, I hate, you're, you're my enemy if you're a friend of the world. You're an adulterer, adulteress if you love the world. Not as I loved it, but loving the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We look at Acts 4, verse 26, and it tells us something interesting. Acts 4, 26, it says, The kings of the earth stood up. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, for of a truth against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod, 
Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined to be before to be done. What do we find here? Do we see the threefold enemy? Herod, Pilate, Herod and Pilate are one, Rome, the Gentiles, or the Greeks, and the people of Israel. We're all gathered together. How does the friendship of the world come together? Do you realize that these three powers that did not like each other, that were separate from each other, that enmity with each other actually did become friends? Friends of the world. How? Let's go with me to Luke 23. Luke 23. And I do have one more verse after Luke. I'm sorry, I an oversight on my step on my site. Luke 23. And I want you to notice with me. I want to begin in verse six because they brought Jesus to Pilate, and you know Pilate was trying to get out of a disagreeable duty. And the minute Pilate had heard where Jesus was from. Oh, you're a Galilean? Oh, okay, well, that's not my jurisdiction. I'm going to send you to Herod. He's over Galilee. We find in Luke 23, verse 6, when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at this time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. It's interesting, it's not going to be the world that's going to be crying after your, or the, or, the, or the state of the civil power per se, it's going to really be the, the church power, the religious element that's going to really be vehemently accusing you before the tribunals, before the judges, the magistrates. They were vehemently accusing him, verse 11, and, when, and Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and set him, sent him again to Pilate, and the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together. For before they were at enmity between themselves. So here's two men that hated each other's guts. Couldn't stand each other. Well, how did they become friends? At the trial of Christ. When it comes to putting Christ to death. God's only begotten son that he sent to the world. All those that are not on Christ's side, even though they might have enmity and odds with each other, they're all going to unite and come together in crucifying him. This is where Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, the threefold enemy, comes together. At the trial of Christ, give us not this man, but give us Barabbas. We have no king but Caesar. This man's blood be upon us and our children forever. This when it comes to crucifying Christ, this is where friendship with the world is made. Any man that's a friend of the world has crucified Christ. You must crucify Christ and reject him first before you become the world's friend. You have to put in work. You have to show your stripes. And putting in work to be accepted of the world's gang is put them to, put them to death. Crucify them. And if you can do that, then you'll be our friend. This is why it's hatred with God. You're an enemy of God. This statement, no, let me, come to, let me come to Ephesians chapter 2 and end with this. Go to Ephesians chapter 2 with me. Who are the enemies of the cross of Christ? It's those that crucify him and put him to open shame. Have I been guilty of this? Yes. Have many of us been guilty of this? Yes. Professing to be the friend of Christ, 
his disciples, but yet we're his enemies. When we look at Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of obedience. So notice, when we're walking according to the course of this world, whose spirit is in us? The prince of the power of the air. Who is the prince of the power of the air? Satan. Satan. That was the spirit that was in the world that crucified Jesus on Calvary. The spirit that works in the children of disobedience, Israel, the Gentiles, Rome. Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So wait a minute now, how do we become the enemy of God becoming a, by becoming the friend of the world? How do we become a friend of the world? By joining with those who crucify Christ or crucify the three angels' messages. And what is it that allows the spirit of Satan to find access to our hearts? What is it? But before that, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes the pride of life, because if we fulfill the lust of the flesh and of, and of the mind, then this lets us know that the love of the world is in us. Worldliness, worldly conformity is in us. And we've crucified Jesus. This statement here in closing tells us, in Review and Herald, February 26, 1895, Review and Herald, February 26, 1895, no union with the church and the world. It says, it was the world that crucified the Lord of life and glory. Jesus was put to death to gratify the malice of the Jews who were filled with the spirit and principles of the world. What were the Jews filled with? The spirit and principles of the world. Therefore, they were the enemy of God, friends of the world and enemy of God enemies of the cross of Christ, it says they hated the spotless son of God because the principles he presented did not harmonize with their ideas, did not coincide with their ambitious aims. They hated him because he condemned all guile, frowned upon every unholy practice, and rebuked their self-seeking policy and love of supremacy. Pilate and Herod became friends in crucifying Jesus Christ. How did they become friends? crucifying Jesus Christ. Notwithstanding, Pilate had pronounced him innocent, he gratified the enmity of the Jews by consenting to the death of one who was guiltless. Even the disciples of Christ were swayed from their allegiance to Christ by the enmity of the world. So even the disciples. And I think that's probably what really hurt Christ the most was his, his own friends. This is why Zechariah 13, 6 and 7 says that one is going to say in heaven, what are those wounds that you've received in your hands? Where'd you get those wounds from? Because Jesus is going to continue to bear the scars, the pierced hands. They become as a badge of honor. It, it shows the work that he put in for us. He really loved us, that it was real. And he's going to say, these are they which I received in the house of my friends. The house of my friends. Think about that. I was wounded in the house of my friends. Your friends did this to you? My friends did this to me. Not his enemies, his friends. You think about that. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. My friends did this to me. And yet, it will remain such for all eternity. To remind us of the cross. So that sin and rebellion and apostasy do not rise up the second time to keep us from sinning against him.
He remains the Lamb for all eternity. This concerning Peter, concerning Judas, those that betrayed him, those that denied him, those that forsook him. This too will be repeated again during the Mark of the Beast crisis. We have two choices. We can either choose Christ and crucify Barabbas, receive the seal of God, or reject Christ, choose Barabbas, receive the mark of Antichrist. Which will it be with us? We must make that decision, even now. Father in heaven, O oh, Father, we come and we realize that at the foot of the cross, we're all equal. We're all sinners. We all are responsible for that shameful and ignominious death. That death which should have been ours. That cup of death that we should have drunk to the dregs. The crown of thorns. The nail pierced hands and feet. A broken heart. It should have been ours. Well, thank you for being able to exchange within our place your divine substitute, your sin bearer, your suffering servant, who was wounded for our transgressions and was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Oh, Father, we pray that we would not be enemies of the cross of Christ, friends of the world. We pray, Father, that we may be able to see why it is that friendship of the world, worldly alliances, worldly customs, worldly demands, worldly conformity is hatred with you because it brings the world together in unrighteousness. It brings them together in crucifying your only begotten Son, the darling of heaven, that you sent into the world, not that we should be condemned, but that we should be saved through him. I pray, Father, that we would not mind earthly things, that our glory would not be in our shame, that our God would not be our belly, that our end would be destruction. We thank you for your love, and we thank you for your grace, and we pray that the power that comes from his nail-pierced hands, that that glory of light that shines from his pierced hands and feet would shine into our hearts and our minds, that it would melt and subdue our stony heart, that a broken and contrite heart will be experienced, that you could revive the spirit of the humble and revive the heart of the contrite ones and that you could dwell with us, that we could be the friends of the cross, ambassadors of the cross, messengers of the three angels' messages in truth and in verity. Bless us to this end as we end. And may your spirit continue to be with us and rest mightily upon all the other ministering brethren and those that will come after. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.